right though Frankie, it's a pleasure to chat with you. I'm looking forward to hearing all your stories. Um, I did oh. uh, watch your interview with the Rocky Files, and that was fantastic. So, uh, lots to, to to dissect from that as well. But um, let's go back to the beginning then, because obviously oh, yeah. Survivor started at the end of the '70s. Jim Peter could come out of Ides of March. He had a, a few hits. So, yeah. so how did you two team up? How did you two get together to form well, Survivor? I, well, you know, I didn't. Uh, Jim's a little older than I am. This, so the Ides, and by the way, I. I I'm not a big Ides fan because back then you have to understand, excuse me, as a guitar player, you know, back then you could be listening to uh, WXSO here, my oldest sister who passed away, but she was totally hip, the Go Go Boots. And she's always had the radio to this awesome station out of Chicago called WXRT. It was a really underground, but they played really cool stuff like, you know, Fleetwood Mac when Peter Green was in the oh, band. Yeah. Cream. I'm going to stop this. Sorry, let me turn this off. They played Cream, um, Jimi Hendrix. So I would go and sit by the tree because it was cool. It was a battery powered radio and it had a turntable on it. So I could put a piece of vinyl, but I was listening to a lot of, um, a lot of like, I started listening to Cream and I started listening to Jimi Hendrix and I started listening to Peter Green and it kind of segued, but it went backwards because. Even at an early, this was before I started playing guitar. I'm kind of okay. a late bloomer. So I didn't start playing guitar until I was like 15. All right. So I started going backwards, like, what are these guys playing? And one day I discovered the most amazing, I think, record ever made on vinyl. B.B. King, Live at the Apollo. It's, it's the holy grail for any guitar player. And then since then, you know, Eric Clapton, well, that's all I ever listened to. So when I went back to the young B.B. King, I said, man, we're trying to do what he does. And, we, you know, the greatest, like Eric Clapton's one of my, everyone's, but he's really one of my favorites because they call him slow hand and he's not always, dee -dee 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 -dee. you know, new players nowadays are fucking great, but I don't know about pentatonic scales. I don't know what that is, um, which is probably why John Mayer is my favorite because he could play everything. He could play the hell out of blues. And when I went backwards, I said, these guys, so from B.B. King, you can go backwards. If you get to like, um, you can get to Jimmy Reed. You go back and listen, I'm Jimmy Reed. And then you get to Johnny Guitar Watson. And I figured out, man, we can't do it. But these the white guys are really famous, like Eric Clapton, even though he struggled with fame then. I don't think he's that big of a fan of it now. But they were a lot more famous than the originators. So when you listen to the cream stuff, you listen to like Freddie King, Albert King, you go, B.B. King, you're like, those are B.B. King riffs that we're trying to play. So I went back and studied the origins. And then when I ran into Peter Green, okay, remember Peter from Fleetwood? He kind of was able to do it because it's really, Eric Clapton said in an interview, we can mimic them, we can try, and he, you could play with a lot of soul, but man, those black guys, man, it's just, so my, my whole thing is we can't dance like they dance. We can't play guitar like they play guitar. We can't sing like they sing. Because when I go back to listen like the original version of When You're Down and Out, you know, Clapton covers that song. Nobody knows you when you're down and out. You go back and listen to the original version. It sounds like two guitar players. It's one. They did all this. Boom, dun, 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 dun. So at an early age, and I think nowadays some of the players, sorry, are a lot more hipper, hip to that. But back then, man, that, that thing was, the black guys were kind of like uh, uh, the best kept secret in the whole guitar world. And then Jimi Hendrix came along. And I think it opened our eyes. And then I think when people started doing, like Eric Clapton at a very young age, well, who's right? Well, B.B. King. So they started giving a lot of light and shedding a lot of light on the origin of what they played. So that's kind of how I started. But I have to tell you, at the same time, it had Pete Townsend. And like I listened to Barbara O'Reilly of yesterday. I put it on when I got in the morning. I said, wow, because one of my favorite concerts, I went to see the Who's Next Tour. Oh, wow. And, you know, and we can talk about it later because Ron Nevison did produce those records. Ron's brilliant. And back then on Synths, they didn't just go, D -d 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 -d. you had to program every oscillator, Every little tweak, and Pete had that big setup. So I'm listening to it going, do, 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 do. I go, you know how hard that would be because you have to program everything. So I went to see them live, and they had it sequencing. When that breakdown, when he went, 
he came out and he went around and he hit his knees and slid across the stage and dodged. He goes, hey, you know what it break? I said, whatever that is up there, I got to try to do that because I had hair, every goosebump hairs on my body kind of went, wow. And then, of course, I saw Zeppelin 11 times <laughs> because I know, but I was a kid, but I'm like, my friends are always about four or five years old. Well, come with us. And the fourth row, and I'm like, they're doing since I've been loving you. Bim, bim, bim. And I'm going, this is on. Un... I realized as a young person, I may never see this, see this again. And sometimes I say, if these younger players could only sit in a fourth row and watch Zeppelin play, because they were sloppy, but great. They just fucking were in the moment. So that's kind of where it started. So the Ides of March were like the other end of the spectrum. I'm like, I don't listen to that shit. Not like meaning it shit, but I wasn't into that stuff back then. I was into the other stuff. So I think the Ides, Jim was more into, um, this is obvious, and he will he should tell you this, but he probably doesn't. He was more into blood, sweat, and tears. That's where you hear the influence. Like if you listen to blood, sweat, and tears in the Ides, it's basically the same thing. So he had us trying to be like, clapped it and cream and flew it back to the old one when Peter Green and then he had the other guys who wanted to be like blood sweat and tears and the crying shames who are great the Buckinghams are all great but they all kind of had that same sound so they kind of originated from the blood sweat and tears thing and by the way I'm a huge Beatle fan but I'm a bigger Rolling Stone fan the guys that went to the blood sweat and tears things they're only Beatles fans and I don't know how you can't fucking love the Stones where I'm from, you got to love the Beatles because of the way they wrote and everything they did. I mean, you have to. Yeah, and it yeah. took me a while to like them as much. But the Stones, I'm like, these guys have no patience. It's like, let's go. Keith's playing bass. Charlie Watts on a practice kit. So I split the difference because you got the totally like thought out. And not too anal you know, because Lennon's pretty radical. It's like, we're fucking done. Did you ever see that video? Getting better all the time. <laughs> I was playing the piano. The piano is going, couldn't get much worse. That's where the part originated from. Go find it and watch it. So I think he was from a completely different thing and era. And then I was from this guitar thing. But there's something in that, what I just said, that makes it special. You know what I'm saying? You get those two guys that are exactly alike. I don't like that. It works probably, I don't really know, but if you get two guys here, and I never can compare us, no one can, Lennon and McCartney, but they're different as night and day. Mm -hmm. So whatever we did because of those differences, I think, in my humble opinion, was better because we're so fucking different. Yeah. But you have to embrace that difference. You can't look and say, I had a fucking guy and that. You have to say we're really different, but look at what we do together. The key word is we. And was you know, that apparent because... fairly early on when you two got together? Because obviously very different backgrounds. Oh, and... you know what? Well, I was playing in a band and they were looking for a guitar player. And they had this fucking amazing Chicago session player. Bruce Geitz was his name. Yeah, I can't play guitar like that. That's not what I'm into. And so they came out to a gig. I was in a band called Mariah. We made a record for United Artists at the time. And they came out to the gig and then they asked me, and they're older guys. I'm like, fuck me, Gary Smith, killer drummer. Dennis Johnson, one of the bass, best play, bass players I swear around. Playing with him made me feel like Jeff Beck, to tell you the truth. He was that good. You want to come and trial for the band? I'm like, well, I don't really get what you cats do, but I went. So it was me and Jim. When we first got, got together, you know, that audition, not audition, him and I playing together, we wrote Somewhere in America. The oh. first time. Well, let's see if we fit together. So we spent the first day, and then let's do it again tomorrow, the second day, writing and finishing somewhere in America. So I said, this is cool. The difference is I, I was able to notice that I think it's somewhat visionary, but I'm not fucking a genius, but I was able to notice in that, in that moment, these differences could be our strengths. I still say that because there's a lot of fucking differences, but whatever. I love the guy, but those differences, I think, made us better. They made us together better. Not better than other people, but they made us better. So fast forward, one day down the road, I'm working with this, this brilliant record producer, engineer, Frank Filippe, Google him. He's amazing. And he says to me, you know what, man? You know, he's a big six foot four New York guy, tight, smoke cigars, loud, smart as a whip. 
Hey, you know what, man? What you get these two guys are exactly the same, man. It ain't happened. You two fucking guys, it, it, it's so different. That's what makes it work. And I don't care who does what. I said, well, me either. So it's kind of an interesting story, but I think in my, in my early age, because they're four or five years, they're four or five years old than I am, Jimmy. So at an early age, I was able to say, these differences are fucking cool. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know if Jim ever got his head wrapped around that. Which is the other part of the story, you know, and why it's like, does anybody give a shit who does what and when and where? We both do it together, all of it. So I don't have to be the guy that does everything. Jim likes to be the guy. And I used to tell him, but there is no guy. What do you mean? I said, well, Leonard and McCartney, there's no guy. What do you mean? I said, Jagger Richards, there's no guy. It's them. So, which probably is another difference that made us work together so well. I think. I always do, but I think you just have to deal with the fact that the differences are what make it sound better between the grooves. Otherwise, it's real generic. You got to have a guy going, man, that's really good. Then you got to have a guy going, that fucking lyric's corny, man. Because yeah, we had a little tendency to go a little bit corny. I'm like, okay, so we're trying to be clever. That doesn't work. Why? Because the people out there are smart. They know, oh, they're trying. So, you know, I was that guy. I don't know, but I like the differences early on, and I still do. Wow. Jim, I don't know, you ask him, you know, he's always, <laughs> I love him, man, but I swear to God, he's always got to be the guy. I told him the other day, man, you got to quit, because I'm friends, and you know, it's with the Stallone people. You know, when when I call him the boss, but his agent calls him the man, when, 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 when Sly Stallone needs a licensing on Tiger, because I control that, I get it to him for nothing almost. Yeah, like he went when he was doing Rocky Four, the re, re, the re, whatever he did a couple of years ago, and he's trying to get music clearances. I got this text from a long front time friend. His he goes, you know, the man, the boss, whatever you call him, says if you don't get this shit straight, he'll use rap music. So he <laughs> wants it by Tuesday. It was a Wednesday. The next day by Thursday, I got him everything for stupid. Like just take it. I think it was like I don't know. It was nothing compared to like the amount of money that. The movie studios yeah. won. So, you know, I don't know. But that's the start of it. Incredible. I have a lot to say. That's the problem with me. But I'm telling you, man, it's all true. There's power in the truth, man. It's authenticity. That's the other thing. You listen to Pete Townsend talk, or you listen to Jimmy Page, they're all about, or Mick Ralphs, they're all about being authentic. You know, you listen to a bad company record, they made the thing in like two weeks. And I'm in the Stones mobile truck, and then the, can't get enough of you. Know, Ron says, Well, that's the mix from the trailer in the truck. Why? Well, because I couldn't beat it in the studio. And he goes, Now I want to show you something. He plays it for me. What's that? He goes, The cymbal fell over during the mix. So it's number one on the radio, huge. And all I could hear when I hear it now is Psh, when the crash cymbal falls over. But Ron taught me, But if I didn't point that out to you, you'd never know. What's the moral of the story? Just let things go. Because if you go back and try to fix it and tell them to recut it, it's never going to recapture what you got in that moment. Well, fascinating stuff from the beginning there. Just a quick question yeah. on the early days as well. John Claude yeah. signed you up, didn't he? So how did you get to come to his attention? I'll tell you what, man. And I still am in touch with him periodically. I, I fucking love the guy. I don't know why he gets any rap that's that's even like secondary to that. The Scotty brothers, who, who I love too, they were a record label, you know that. So when we were going to go to Atlantic Records, they were going to sign us, the Greenbergs. And Collider was the head A&R, so he signed like ACDC, Genesis. I mean, if you look at his, yeah, <laughs> this crazy. guy's fucking major talent to do. He said, you know, I'm going to put you guys on my friend's label, Scotty Brothers. And I'm young. I'm like 21 to 20 at the time. I'm like, whatever. I don't fucking know. So he put us on Scotty Brothers. And he never, ever let go of the reins until we were acting like, well, the band. I hate to include myself. We were acting like a bunch of asses. And then we ended up on our own without Ron. But he always, uh, he, he was, he just really liked us. And he's a he's a great fan of music and songs and guitar players and singers. 
But well, I don't know. I don't have anything bad to say about him. I know I hear guys like Perry or Tyler, like, ah, I said, the fucking guy has this. You got to look at it from you do what you do, I do what I do. He do, he does what he does. Well, when you sign ACDC, Jen, the list is forever. You're talented. Because who would have signed AC? Nobody wanted to sign him. Well, I'll sign him. Like Genesis, the original with Peter Gabriel. I'm going to sign him. You should see his, you look at his discography. It's second to none. So we got hooked up with him through the Scotty brothers. Well, he was really close. It was really good because John's a really cool guy. He's a Jewish guy, long beard. And you got Tony and Ben Sky. They're like, you know, we're going to get together today. Everything's going to be great. You know, two Italian guys. <laughs> they loved each other. So it was, I think, really great for us on the start. And we should have kept it that way. But fucking bands, man. It could be, it could be 80 degrees out, sunny, swimming pools. Chicks, hot chicks all over the place. Every guitar you ever wanted, every car you want, and are going to get fucking find something to pick on. You know, we kind of fucked it up. But with John, I still t stay in touch with him because he's special. Not just to me. Well, to me too, but he's special. That's a gift. Mm -hmm. That's a fucking gift. And then you got to go to the head of the label. Maybe they're going, well, I don't want to sign White Stick. Like when he went to Geffen, John built Geffen Records. Yeah. All those acts are his. Well, okay, okay. So they end up selling all. David Geffen sold the company. He made like two billion dollars. You know, this, this is a guy colliding with some really deep talent. So here and see, that's a whole other thing. But yeah, I love him. That's how we got hooked up with him. I hear from him now and then. He'll hit me up on Instagram, and he's just hysterical. He's hysterical, man. My the last picture he sent me was him. And he dressed as an all white, right? As everything's white. And he had all these hookers dressed in black leather. He goes, this is my new promo shot. I said, that's fucking perfect. It was perfect because he always liked the hookers. So he used six hookers in black leather miniskirts and him with his white suit on. It's just, a, I saved it. It's great. <laughs> a character, oh. a real character. But this is a talented man. You know, that's a hard thing. I wouldn't want that job. Difficult indeed. And then obviously the, the band's early career, it built steadily, didn't it, over those first couple of records and Premonition uh, in 81 was big, had a couple of big singles on there, Poor Man's Son and, and Summer Nights as well. And then you got the call from Hollywood. You've mentioned Sylvester Stallone and, and I of the Tiger and things like that. And it's the one we all know about. So so take me back to the beginning of that and how you came to the attention of Sylvester. Tony Scotty, you know, it's a simple story. I think I said this on a podcast. Maybe it was with Steve. I don't know. I said, the fucking story's been, you know, how things get like, I don't know. They get like, all of a sudden, I'm like, where the fuck did that story come from? They get like blown up. And, like Chinese and, whispers, you know, it changes. Yeah. Everything, you put it this way, everything, 95 or 9 percent of what you heard is complete made up bullshit. Tony Scotty, who was head of Scotty Brothers, was friends with Sylvester Stallone, the two Italian guys in Hollywood. So as a young guy, when I'm going through Scotty Brothers Records, the label, they got all these fucking posters of Sylvester Stallone. I'm like, what the autograph? I'm like, the fuck are these up here for? Well, they're really good friends. So they were out to dinner one night at Rayo. That's this Italian restaurant here. And this is true, too. The movie was done. Sly Stallone wanted different music, and he didn't want to put the fucking movie out. So Tony's a smart guy. He's real smart. He's like, well, you know, I could, he didn't say it, but this is my take. I could use the help, too. That's if you want to read between the lines. I have this band. They're really fucking good. And I think these two guys are right, good writers. Why don't you let them see what they could do? That's it. The rest of it's bullshit. It, that's, it's all phenomenalized bullshit. The phone... I have to read this stuff. The call that rocked the world. There's no fucking call. It's all bullshit. He called one person, me. Okay. And it lasted like about 30 seconds. And then as time went on, you know, we would have to, I would have to, we would have to talk with him and stuff. But when I listen to, that's why I said I don't want to do interviews. When I listen to some of the stuff, it's bullshit. There's always a real person involved who should get, like the Scotty brothers. Like one day I got a call from him. Well, it's about time. And this was like maybe two years ago. It's 50,000 years later. What? Well, where do I, 
they should get credit. Like Tony for that moment being out to dinner with his friend who happens to be the biggest movie star in the world going, no, man, I don't like the music. Well, I got this band that he should get big credit for that because without the Italian food, that rest setting, being friends with Slice Stallone, it's all out the window. And nobody fucking knows that. I'm like, Jim, why don't you just tell him, man, Tony and Sly were and are friends and that's it. The rest of it is bullshit because I have to read it. I just stopped. I said, it's a lie. It's a fucking lie. It's a flat out lie. None of it happened. And I'm like, I used to take not heat, but I used to just say, ah, yeah, just leave things be. And then one day, I think the man said, and you know, some of those stories, I said, I know, I know. I get embarrassed really easy. I know, man. And so I said, yeah, I'll just start telling the truth. What the fuck? How are you going to go wrong? I said, but you know, I don't ever want to look like there's a rip between me and Jim because Jim likes riffs, and, but he knows better, but he likes to project. I hate them and they don't exist. So one day I decided, fuck it, I'll just tell a story. It's just the truth. It's true. So it's pretty simple. But, you know, it's being in the right place at the right time for everybody. Yeah. Tony Scotty, Tony's, Tony's a fucking genius, man. He's still out there making deals. Don't forget he owned Bill. He owns Baywatch and he's big. <laughs> so, you know, in that moment, he's like, well, here. And that's which is what I would do. It's amazing, is it? Now you hear about the rock that call it rock the world. It never fucking existed. <laughs> Guy called up, yo, you know, Tony told me to call you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what do you get say on the phone to Sly Stallone when you're like 22? He just listens. You go, okay, so we'll try to, yeah, put some song together. And you're sending a tape, and how the fuck do you know? You don't. So that's what we did. And Tiger was the first song, by the way, we wrote two, okay? Tiger was the first song. It took us 10 minutes, except for the lyrics. The lyrics took us, because we didn't have... Watching us all with the eye through that we didn't have that one fucking line. Okay. All the other the writing in the song was basically done in 10 minutes, except for the hook line, which is the most important line. But man, it was a hard two or three days coming. Then one day it just dawned on both of us. Wait a minute. We and we didn't even think about the movie making connections. We just came up with the tagline. We called it the eye of the tiger, but we didn't know how to end the chorus. I'm like, man, Jim, we must suck as songwriters. We got to come up with like a great tagline. And we're sitting around and they're watching us all with, you know, then we got to analyze where we're through, whatever, watching us all blank with the eye through the eye of the tiger. That's how it came up. And when we sent it in, we wrote another ballad called Ever Since the War Began, which, which Sly Stone ended up using at the end of Lockup. And he had Jimmy sing it. What a fucking voice. Jimmy Jameson saying, and it was just fucking great. So he said to me, hey, uh, I like the first song, which is Tiger. And we were like, ah, that's just movie music. To us, we were doing a demo. And he goes, and the second song, I want to put a hold on. I'm like, well, how the fuck you put a hold on a song? You know, because you're thinking at the time of head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. And then, you know, we got word that he wanted to use it. And then we did, by the way, the version in the movie is not the version on the record. You know that, right? The version in the it's a fucking demo that they all cried about. I'm like, if we don't get it in, everybody, and this isn't going to last forever. You know, I should say that it's going to move on. And this guy's fast. What do you mean? I said, he's smart. He's rewriting scenes and stuff. We don't get this in. We're going to miss it. And then Sly's like, what the fuck is a demo, man? He said to me one day, go, man, what's the matter? I said, oh, fuck the guys, man. What? Demo? The fuck is a demo? So I said, yeah, like Pete Townsend would say, what's a demo? So I, we just, I said, well, we'll use the demo. So we, the, movie, the version in the movie is actually the demo. I still have the cassette tape. It says Rocky Three demo on it. I still have it because wow. I said, this is hysterical. I still have it. It's hysterical because we got to re-record. I'm like, we, we got to fucking tie. We're going to miss the whole, the whole window. The whole thing just go out the window. So and you know, Sly was attached to it anyhow, so why not just roll with it? Yeah, I actually like the difference. I know what the difference is: is more bass, it's got a little bit more boom. You know, when you hear, oh, let's record it for, let's do it for real. I don't know what that meant. Okay, but in the meantime, you lose all that. You're doing a demo. You lose all that. Yeah, you're just moving faders, and then boom. 
yeah, and you print and it comes together, and you can't ever recreate that. So I had more bass and more kick drum that boom, boom. Listen to his kicking, and he fucking loved it. He was, I don't even want to hear anything else. I said, well, then that answers that question. Yeah, so that was it. Fantastic the stuff. Like history. The rest, well, it's true. The rest was like history because you're like going, oh, he's going to use it. It's funny. Then you go to the movie theater. Let me go see the movie. It's like, on the way there, true. I have three radio station, XRT, WLS, and no, XRT, I forget the loop, one of the station. I'm switching, and all three of the stations are playing a song. I'm like, hey, maybe this is going to be a hit record, the beauty of youth. So I get to the movie, and they start going, Dig it, and the people start cheering when Tiger starts. And then at the end, the fucking people stand up and applaud. I go, oh, they must really like the movie. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was kind of kidding around tongue in cheek, but that's another thing. It, it, you know, people should feel like we're all blessed, but you have to be grateful. But you work hard. We all do. You, me, no matter what we do, we work hard. People should feel like, wow. I think we should always remember that word. My grandson. Wow. Okay. That's how I am sometimes. Wow. You know, it's a big thing. And, you know, it all came out of a relationship between two guys out to dinner. One of the biggest movie star in Hollywood ever. And one half with the music. And then we get Tiger in on three stations and people stand up and clap. And the rest of it from there was just a great big one great ride without any downs. It was just. Because and just in terms like, of the movie itself, when you're watching that, did you did you get like goosebumps or the hair standing up on the back of your neck when you saw how beautifully the music matched and they made it match everything that was well, going on in the, in the scene? That's another thing. Sly, Sly Stallone is really smart. So he liked it so much that he went and he recut some of that montage. To because this is another story. Queen was in there. Yeah. It was another one. Bites us, and then I have, I'll tell you later. So. When he got Tiger, he liked it so much, so he kind of recut to the rhythm of the song, and he added a few scenes. You know, hi, it's the Muppet Show, all the stuff he did on there. He's a fucking great filmmaker. He doesn't even get the credit, but he's a really good filmmaker. So doing that made the song even better for the movie, but you got to give him the song so he could make it better. So I think it was like one hand washes the other, but he did a great job with it. Fucking did a great job. Then you fast forward, we're playing at the foreman. My guitar tech comes, hey, you know, Brian May wants to meet you. Brian May, because he's one of my fucking idols. I love, how, could, how do, does anybody not like Brian May? Nicest guy in the world. A total gentleman. I'm like, wow, I'm like free. I go to meet him. He's like, totally Brian May. He's then chill out. He goes, we're talking. He goes, so uh, was uh, was our song in there? Yeah, it was in there, Brian. Yeah, another one. That's what I heard. I said, no, I have a cut, but I can't give it to you because I don't know if the man would get mad at me, but which I still have. I have the original. <laughs> I have the first 10 minutes because Sly sent the first 10 minutes and I had to call him up. I'm like, hey, dude, what? It's not like we're going to make bootleg copies in the fucking garage. We want to see the whole thing. <laughs> I did, as I said to him. So maybe that was like when we first hooked up. And um, then he sent the whole movie, but it had another one bites the dust in it. So I have a copy of the first 10 minutes with nothing. Then I have a finished copy with Another one bites the dust, and then I have Tiger. And I say, with the original script of Rocky Three, with Sly changing scenes and notes, it's in a safety deposit box. Because I think somewhere along the line, somebody told me, I don't think that the man ever wants to see that shit for sale on eBay. I'm like, well, I wouldn't do that anyhow, but it's probably worth the fortune, but I don't look at things that way. I know he, I know his original script, some guy owns it. I know it pisses him off. I, if I was the guy, I would just give it back to him. He has this, this red notebook where he wrote, he handwrites. He wrote the whole Rocky thing out and some billionaire owns it. I would just give the fucking thing back to him. And he says, that's not the way the thing world works, kid. So, okay. But I have it all in a safety deposit box. And I went there about two years ago to make sure it was still there. The bank is like, you know, you have a safety deposit box here for like 40 years. Yeah, I know. We have to come and open it, you know, make sure that it's used. So go ahead, let me see what's in it. It was all still there. Because you never know. I'm always worried about, I don't think about this, but that stuff's worth a fortune. Yeah. Not that you want to do anything with it. I'm like, I'm going to go look. I remember I got up early. When's the bank open? I went over there and it was still in there intact. 
It's fun though to have it because it's yeah. part of it. That's why I found the a fucking Maxwell remember is it live a Maxwell cassette tape, uh Rocky three slash demo. And the same, so I left it there. I said, this is better in this bank then. I just wow. said, if you guys are ever gonna bulldoze the bank or sell it, just let me know so I can come get it. Yeah. No, we can't do that. There's laws. I said, Well, I was just kidding, but make sure that I come in and check it. But it's still there. Yeah, it's but that, that song and that movie and the, the combination, it, it's almost part of American culture. It's it's part of American history. It's the sort of thing that probably should end up in a, a museum somewhere. I would think, you know, you don't, I don't think like that, but I have to agree with you. Didn't it kind of just, I think it grew into all of that over the years. Yeah. I was talking to his brother, you know, I'm really good friends. Frank Stallone is one of my best friends. And he's always, I don't believe you can't win the fucking Oscar with that, which maybe we, they're not going to give, you know how that Academy is. They're not going to give it to a rock and roll band. But all these years later, the song that won, nobody ever hears it. So maybe there's a point to that. I remember Sly Stone telling me, yeah, they fucked us, man. <laughs> after what I saw him at the after party, but I never looked at it that way. I just, you just got to enjoy the ride because you're not going to get like that many of those rides. If one, if one, mm -hmm. I'll take the one. And we had a couple, but that's kind of a fun story. It's a good start. You know. Fantastic start, and then just moving on. Obviously, that was Rocky Three. Rocky Four came along. So, um, yeah. did Sly come to you straight away? Was it like, guys, I need another one? Well, Tony Scott, he came to the Scotty Bros. He, well, he wants another song, and then we came up, but it was called "The Unmistakable Fire." And then Sly hated this. He hated the fucking title. <laughs> you know, on the Burning Heart, the Unmistakable Fire. So you know, Burning Heart was, but the title was Unmistakable Fire, and I could see that. I go, that title sucks. So Sly's like, the title sh fucking sucks. They got to change it. So then Tony Scott goes, you guys have to go up to Stallone's office on the lot. And we went up to, he's like, yeah, that title's got to go. So, okay, we'll just call it Burning Heart because it's part of it. And it needs something in the course. Excuse me. What do you mean? He goes, I don't know, like what? I don't know, like a whip? Jim and I sit around looking at each other. What do you mean? He goes, like, 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 <laughs> like an explosion. I said, like a whip? So we had Peter Wolf, the keyboard guy that went on and like work on the rest of our records on keyboards. The guy that was in Zappa. In Zappa, yeah, yeah. Fucking great. He did fucking unbelievable talent. Great producer. We had him come in with his San Clavier and it's in a very hard, one, one, one press of the key. Sent it in and Fly goes, yeah, that'll work. And that was Burning Heart Story. And then that went to number two, which is kind of nice too. Was there ever, I was going to say, was, was there ever any, because obviously Eye of the Tiger was a worldwide hit and he ran it really quickly. Was there any pressure, did you feel, to to come up with something that was going to stand up to that song? Because let's be honest, it's always going to get compared, wasn't it? So did you feel any pressure in writing Burning Heart? There might have been, but if there was, I didn't fucking care. I didn't pay. It. I didn't, I don't remember it. I don't think so. Because we we're in the middle of doing like the Vital Signs tour. Yeah. We we're on the road that which lasted 22 months. That's all, which was a fucking blast. And it was like we had to fly in out of town to do the song. It fit in perfectly to like the lifestyle back then. So you're on the road nonstop, you're doing four shows with Jimmy Jameson, five shows a week. The fucking guy's amazing. And then you take you'd have a few days off. So you'd come out here and cut the track. You'd come out here and work on a track. It all just worked. Almost kind of seamlessly, now that I think about it, it's kind of another blessing with time, you know, it just kind yeah. of moved naturally. Like we didn't have to force it, we didn't have to cancel dates, we didn't have, oh, this needs to get done now. So I guess there wasn't any pressure to it. We just did what we did. And he liked it. Then I said to him one time, you know, that song, it's really good. What? No easy way out, man. That should that should be the lead song. <gasps> be quiet. I hear the guys getting all mad at me. You remember that Robert Tepper song that, that's in that montage in Rocky Four? Did yeah. you ever that's a killer track, man? Yeah. Especially in that film. And you know, me, I have to see both all all the worlds at once. I'm like, that should be the lead track. And all like, shut up, throwing stuff. <laughs> at me. Well, because I felt that it should be. Now, if you watch it, go watch it, you'll say. Yeah, it's really good. And that's where he cut the montage when he's driving the car. That was a great track. So I'm like, well, we got past that one. What do you mean? Because if it were me, if I was in a collateral, I'd say, you guys going to have a great cut. It's going to be hit. But 
track one's going to be that Robert Tepper, no easy way out. And then they're like, you got to fucking shut up. About... Well, the other side of my brain could actually see where that would be huge. So, and he was on Scotty's too. So there, we got a little, a little bit lucky there. We did because they could have said, push this mm. one. Yeah. Or maybe it was because it was a follow-up with the Rocky thing, the Tiger. There's a lot of really good, the whole thing is great. I just remember that moment going, when I heard Tepper, I'm like, man, that should be the fucking lead track. <laughs> fucking shut up, man. Are you kidding me? Put everything. Well, wait a minute. I don't want to ruin anything, but it's really good, man. Don't say that. <laughs> You know how things get. Yeah. But, well, that's me. I kind of have this weird. I have left and have right of my brain, and one side can side can see a different picture. Even if it like you may say it, I wouldn't put it this. Way. Even if it doesn't work to my benefit, whatever that means. I guess a song, the fancy. I can always see. Well, hmm, that's a producer. I mean, I think that might work better, but. That's kind of when you're in a band, you got to be really careful what you fucking say. Because six months later, you're like in, you're in Germany somewhere and you're doing 20 shows, and the guy's mad at you. You wanted to fucking put Robert Tepper's song in. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> I just wanted to peace all the time. That was my job. I'll be the peace. By the way, don't ever take that job on. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the burning heart but he let us alone man he just wanted to whip in it he let us alone i i give a people a lot of credit because i think that people in so much as Stallone's position can they could do a lot and then you would get the meddler types that would just meddle and ruin everything he just let us alone and now i think about it in this moment probably because he wanted people to fucking leave him alone in the beginning when they said, you can't act, you got droopy eyes. You ever that whole story? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe, you know, I just thought of that. Maybe I should say one time, oh, hey, man. Yeah, I went through the same shit. So I said, I'll just leave everybody to fuck alone. Could be. You don't know, but it could be. Absolutely. And just mixing timelines slightly, you mentioned Jimmy Jameson and um, oh, going back to, to Dave Bickler, because obviously he had medical issues after um, Caught in the Game album came out and obviously issues with his throat and things like that. Um, he oh, left... Jimmy, Dave did. Dave, Dave did, yeah. He, yeah, yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. yeah, so but what was the decision in terms of him leaving the band? Um, was it a management thing? Was it you guys? Was it well, him? Want me to be, do you want me to be like brutally honest with you? Because I could do that. Go for it. <laughs> I had absolutely no hesitation, no problem, no, well, let me think about it, with, with replacing Dave, none, none. You want me to tell you why, in my opinion? Mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck. All you friends and lovers and haters and all that shit out there, you were, he wasn't the front man we needed. That's important. Yeah. Don't forget at the time you had my friend, Lou Graham out there. You had Steve Perry. Out. You got to have a fucking front man. Dave wasn't a front man. He was not. And then two, you have to have endurance to do that job. You know, talk to Steve Perry sometimes about it. Look at what Bruce Springsteen just went to. It's hard. I'm like, Bruce, you can't do three hour shows when you're like 70 years old. I love him, but Dave never had the endurance to do that. It's hard. Fucking when I went to used to go see Jerry because you know Steve Perry I like him and he had a really great attitude and he had that whole lead singer thing where like because he just wanted to be the singer and he became the star the rest of the guys hated him and the band usual story yeah. <laughs> I'm like you know that's how it's gonna be told so Jameson these guys are gonna hate you in a year but don't pay attention to it but I had no I was relieved I was really happy and for a, a few weeks we didn't have a singer. I was like, I don't care. It was better. I, I I felt innately, I don't know why, I don't know what the fuck it was, but I felt like this is better than what we had going on because what we had going on was dark. There's a lot of drugs involved. And I never, I'm not a drug guy and I don't, whatever, to each his own. There's a lot of fucking conniving and it was dark. And I just said, this is bullshit. I want, we need a guy that could fucking a good looking guy that can sing the shit out of our songs that we write. And I look around, I go like Steve Perry and Lou Grant. You know, these guys are fucking great. It's hard to find someone. Yeah. But Jimmy came in. By the way, then he has to be the first guy we audition. And the first guy, and I'm like, this is, here my, here's my brain. This is fucking unbelievable. 
We were rehearsing in a carpet, the part of a carpet warehouse tent we owned in right. Chicago. <laughs> and he comes in, he's the first guy. It's Jim, it's Jameson. I'm like, this can't be fucking real. Then they're like, we should try other people. Like, I'm like, what? What? Boys, well, if I don't give a fuck if he, they want it. So we did for like a week and a half or two weeks. And I kept going. So I told a road crew, my brother was on the road crew, a friend of mine from that I'd known since freshman year. And I'm like, man, we're going to fuck get. So one day, it was a Friday. I finally got, and I didn't get this. I got pissed off. I said, you guys, what? Fuck you. You could either get the guy from Memphis back or then look for another guitar player too. That's how strong I felt about Jameson. And in the meantime, the other guys don't know that I like to keep like really smart people like Ron Nevison. He's a fucking genius, man. It's a hard job to produce records. I sent him cassette tapes at rehearsal. I have like, high on you, broken promises. Says, what do you think of the guy? The guy sounds fucking great. What's he like? I said, he's a great guy. Why aren't the... So I finally said, look, we either get the guy back from Memphis or look for another guitar player because this is going to go on forever. Ron said he'll do the record, but he's at the same time. He's Ron back then, like four, everybody wanted him. He's telling me on the phone, I have other projects to do. And that's kind of scary because he did. <laughs> so we got him back and he came in. And I found out that the road crew never let him leave town. <laughs> My brother Kevin and Rick, the tour man, no, he stayed in Chicago this whole time in a hotel. And he went out drinking, having a good time, eating, dinner stuff with the crew. Until we fucking got our brains, our heads out of our butt and said, where is this guy? And I said, you're lucky because we kept him in town. I was like, my heart went, oh, God, thank God. <laughs> he was fucking Jimmy, man. Badass. He's a badass, man. He was so fucking good. And he changed. I think at that time, man, as much as they loved us, I think we're on the brink of the Scotty brothers cutting us loose. I do. They changed um, distributors from Atlantic and they went to Columbia. They went to Epic, which was a great label at the time. And I think they're looking at us going, these fucking guys better do something. We'll just drop them. Because, you know, after Tiger, the next record didn't really do that good. And the next one didn't. And then I had this, I when we got Jameson, I had this idea and it worked out. Um, Ron, you know, Ron did our first record, okay? Do you know that story about Ron? He got, he fucking quit because they kept bothering him every day. I'm like, and here's me, I'm a guitar player. So he did at UFO, he did, you know, Michael Schenker, he did Bad Company, Mick Ross, he did Zeppelin, Jimmy Page, the who took Pete Thompson. I'm like, I think he's really good. I know you guys are older than me, but maybe you're dumber too. I didn't know, I didn't want to say it, but I'm like, we should just go with him. Okay, so we get Ron, and all they did was fuck with the guy. Because he's like, no, nah, that's not how you do it. And so about eight months, I swear to God, that first record, probably $700,000 out the window. That's a lot of money in wow. 19. Yeah. Well, John Collado was prepared to spend it. And then they, I still have the notes, like, where they sent Ron when he needed to correct it. He looked at it, he said, fuck it, I quit. And that almost broke my heart. So, because if you go back, I have like somewhere in America, the way Ron wrote it, I'm playing slide guitar. It's, I should put it out someday just to say, look at you guys, what could have happened. It's, it's fucking way better. So we get Jimmy to Van Ron, that's great. I'll do it. So I said, Ron, at the time he was having a bit of a thing in which he was coming out of, he was living up in Sausalito, the record plant up in, out, you know where Sausalito is, and working out of there because he's always good friends with Chris Stone. And um, we got Ron because at the time, people were looking at him like, no, he's got a thing going on. And our manager, John Barrick, who should get so much credit that he never fucking, people don't mention the name. He went to bat with the head of, Walter Yetnikoff was a heavyweight. He's the head of Columbia. He said, no. Yeah, this is who they want to use. I'm not using them to draw it. No, no. Okay, so here. If you don't want to use it, you're not only you're not going to get a follow-up to Tiger and all that, but he had REO. He goes, I'm not giving you a follow-up to high infidelity. That's heavy. Well, if you're at, at Columbia, okay, use them. 
And I won't tell you what we paid Ron, but it was a song and a dance compared to his normal fee. I never saw him or any other producer. And with Ron, he's also a film. He doesn't use engineers because he's too good. He, he's a fucking killer engineer. He built the Stones mobile unit. I mean, this guy's on. Look it up sometimes. So with Ron, you get the engineering. I've never seen anyone, much less Ron, work that hard. And he's fucking smart, man. He hears all this stuff in his set. So when you put parts down, he's, I never saw anyone work so hard. And then Vital Signs came out with Jimmy. I remember going, thank God. I was walking through, this This is, was kind of like my crowning moment where I said, and I don't mean this like, I said, okay, so I was right. But I just said, no, this is good. I was going to Epic, and it wasn't out yet, but the Epic people had heard the record, and we finished the video. So every desk I went past of that, there was a chick sitting at, like even like hot chicks. She says, Braggy, Braggy, hey, what are you doing? We love your new fucking singer, man. We got to meet him. Oh, I get to the next desk. And, hey, man, Braggy, went, that singer's gorgeous. All these chicks. So I got back to, it was Larry Stessel. He was like head of promotion. I got to his office. I said, can I use your phone? I call up John, our manager, John. Goes, John, I think we might have a hit record out of my hands. Laughing. Oh, you think so? Did it happen to you too? I said, every desk, every desk that had a chick. I said, and the one with the guys are like the fucking singer's great. So it was a moment. And not that I needed it, but I don't know why it would, I don't know why there would be anything other than good stuff about the Jimmy Jameson story. We're lucky. We were lucky they kept him in town. He tries out first. We'll just say, fine, it's his God, whatever you want to call it. We're done. First guy and get on with it. But you got to go to bands. Bands, let's spend two weeks looking for. We got the, you know, Kevin, we got this Kevin Shelfont guy. And I never knew him. One of Jim's friends. I said, that's enough. What? When we start trying out fucking friends that are nowhere near good enough, as, as, as much less as good as Jimmy Jameson, then I'm done. There was a whole thing. I'm like, can we just fucking get on with it? And then we got on with vital signs. And Jimmy became a star in about a week. Yeah. And that's he funny. said to me in Tokyo, man, he was a fucking great guy. I mean, he's fucking, the guy was, man, he had that slang. Elvis, he sounded just like Elvis, but man, what? He was right, man. What are you talking about? They all hate me. I said, they always hate the fucking singer because when he's great, he's the fucking star. They can't deal with that. Just fuck them. So he finally stopped doing it and just did his thing. You know, I said, how do you know about that? I said, well, people like Steve Perry would tell you. They, he told me. They fucking, he has to leave the band because they hate him. Why? Because he's so fucking good. I don't know what the answer to is. Is it a jealous thing? I said, I think that'd be putting it lightly. It's a whole thing and I don't even know how to explain it. But when the guy has to leave a band because it can't stand him because he's so good, the band's fucked up. No offense to anybody. I always say friends and lovers and haters and whatever it is, but it's a true story. Jimmy was really good, man. I'm telling you, then maybe he sang a track twice at the most. Wow. Ron would say, or when I'd work with him myself, like uh, Man Against the World, ever since the war began, it's, I swear, one take, and I said, just sing your second verse. And it's so good. We get to do the record. Even Ron goes, Ron, I hear he goes, well, what do you want me to do with this? I said, well, he goes, didn't I teach you enough? He goes, listen to it. I said, but it's my Lynn drum machine. There's a fuck about the drums, man. Listen to the fucking lyrics, the way this guy sings. And Jimmy had great clarity. So you could, un this is a gift too. You could understand every single word he sang. I told Jim one time, we're looking to get to us in the mouth because if you want to be a prick about it, he's a songwriter's dream. You can understand every word. Where's with Dave? You got to go, what's that word? You know, Jimmy was just special guy, man. Amazing guy. Amazing guy. He just got into some stuff that wasn't all that good for him. That's all. Which happens. It happens, man. But I fucking miss him, man. He's fucking great. Yeah. I was lucky to be in a band with him. He's every bit as good as Steve Perry. And that says everything I need to, you need to know because I'm a huge Steve Perry fan. And always include your story about the fuck a band hates me, the whole thing, I get the whole thing. Probably a curse of mine. I'm like, why do I always hate the fucking singer? Of course, if he's great, he's going to be the star, but that means like you're going to do better. 
The ants are really weird, man. You have to know that. It's just a, <laughs> so, they weird enough to come on your show and cop to it. That's all. He <laughs> towns it would. Then they get over it. See, when they get as time goes on, they get over that shit. That's true. And talking about time going on and getting over things, I mean, um, a bit later on, obviously, reunion tours and things like that, you got Dave and Jimmy together, didn't you, with yeah. with the band? Yeah. So so how did all that come about? Whose idea was it? And did you have to talk anyone into it, or was everyone on board from the start? It was my idea, but I, man, dude, I don't think it was my one of my better ideas. I don't know what, I think, I I just loved to play those the hits live to this fans and audience and I just thought if you had both of them you could really do everything you know so and if you think about the purity of that thought it's a really good thought but the reality is always <laughs> you must know about reality you don't have to be mean the reality can differ with what we think sometimes um it never really worked because the differences and they got on really good but the differences between those two guys that wasn't very healthy for Dave. That was not good for him to be in with Jimmy. And that's just, it's a hard gig, man. The fucking guys, he's a hard act to follow. When you're playing a show, man, and you look over and Steve Perry comes to your fucking show, your singer's a fucking great singer. Okay, or he don't come to shows all the time. He said to me one time, Steve Perry goes to me, man, that guy, he turned sideways. He goes, the only thing he's missing that I got is this schnoz. You know, Steve Perry said, yeah, <laughs> yeah he did. said that to me once. I said, that's a huge compliment. He goes, yeah, it is. So, you know, it was hard. For, it was hard for Dave because then you have a guy that's really great on the stage with the audience and audience friendly. And then, then he, Dave's kind of timid. And it just, it, it put the spotlight on both of them and one of them it was good for the other one it wasn't good for so i said this isn't gonna work and then jimmy always told me just find a young guy that looks like me man that could sing all the fucking hits man because the fucking keys are getting high and stuff i said jimmy you sing the formula i'm just saying man and then we did and cameron came into the picture so, that, but that didn't work that good i don't think that was healthy for dave i don't yeah i just don't and just oh, yeah. chatting about um, various incidents over the years with the names of the band and and, and things like that. How's how's things between uh, oh. yourself and Jim these days? Is that a completely closed book now? Nothing's ever. You know, when the book's closed, maybe unless until some back someone comes back and tells me it, it, it's closed. Maybe like when they bury us and they're pissing on the roses. Maybe the book closed. I don't think the book's ever closed. You know, we don't talk like we should talk a lot more. We we don't. I you know people do these podcasts. They don't know to look at you on the screen or look at you over here at the camera. So if I'm looking to the side, people should know I'm looking at you. Should we should? They have to invent that we're right in the camera as the guy you're talking to. Yeah. Anyhow, what was I talking about? Um, where were we? I got lost with that. You and so, Jim, and, and where are things now? Oh yeah, we should talk a lot more. I don't know why we don't. Um, or I do know why we don't, and I just, I'm not positive, but I don't want to say it because 20 some years, 22 or three years, maybe like a thousand songs. Jim and I wrote songs Monday through Friday, generally about one to two o'clock till after traffic, which is, which was about seven. And it wasn't unusual that I would go in on a Saturday, do a mix, or we would meet there and tweak a song and then put a vocal on. So that's a lot of years, you know, people, I didn't need to get older, older. You like that choice of words. I didn't need to get older to figure it out. I think I knew that when I was younger, but that's a lot of fucking songs, man. And I hear these interviews when Ron did, I wrote Ron on a podcast and he's talking about, he's worked with Desmond Child, great songs. He got to us, he goes, those two fucking guys, man. Those two guys are the shit. And I'm like, Jim, are you watching this? I, to my In my head, I'm like, because I think when you spend that much time together writing stuff and those differences are strengths they are even if you're not getting on you know we don't always none of us always get on it's life but when those differences are such strong points i don't think there's any room for the nonsense to go on jim just has a different you have to remember jim wanted to sing searches over on the record 
And I told him he was out of his mind. So that probably didn't go over good. Well, we got this guy. The song was number one for a month. I think that I was right. Then he should tell it. So he's, and then he would start, there would be bad, bad moments with Ron, bad vibes. And Ron going to him and Ron say, don't fucking say it. Don't say it. He taught me, let people speak for themselves. But you want to sing search. Okay. Take him fucking home so I could do the vocal because Ron has no patience for that stuff. And he goes, and you know I'm right. So I think that maybe, I don't know, I'll be that honest because what's the worst I could be is wrong. I think maybe that Jim might have some attitudes about that. Or like being the guitar player. I didn't say it one day. Ron said one day, you know, I worked with Michael Schenker. I was doubling some guitar parts. He said, he could be the only guy that doubles guitar parts as good as Michael Shanker. And then I'm like, did he just fucking say that? Because he's a fucking killer guitar player. You know that. And I'm right. like, okay, so, but Jim wants to play guitar. He's like, you hire me to do this. It sounds better when you double the part. Well, that's the producer's job. So get mad at him. And he'd say, but you could tell him. So then I'd be the mouthpiece. Ron, he'd say, look, man, you got to stop talking for other people. And one day I said the other day, you know what the worst thing you could be in life? And I said, I don't even know if it's worst. Don't ever be the leader of a fucking band. Just don't do it. I said that on some interview. I said, just your stomach will be a lot better if you're not like the, the proxy leader of the band. And everybody else wants to project your leader because you become this peacemaker and you can't make peace with that stuff because someone has to make a decision. So when you hire the producers and it searches over, this is like a Great song. It was number one for a month. It was the third single. It was the video. The video was number one, too, uh, for a month on MTV. And he's like, but I could sing the song. I'm like, no, no, no. And then later on, I was like, you know, I could have sang that song. Dude, the fucking song was number The video, did you see him? Do you see our audience, how it's changed? The video was number one for a month. They loved the guy, but I could have sang the song. You just have to go, fuck it. You don't want to hear it anymore. So... There could be that rub in there. And then the guitar thing that was really Ron's. Ron did what he wanted to. That When you hire someone of Ron's caliber, and he would argue with Paul Rogers, too. He would argue with Jimmy Page. He would argue with the Stones. But when you hire someone of Ron's caliber, then you have to be able to accept. When he goes, you know, I'm going to tell you about certain songs. You cannot polish a turd. You can't get mad at him. You got to just say the song sucks. So the next two records, you can't bring in the same song. What about this song? Because he's going to go, we dealt with that two records ago. They get a little bit aggravated, like you would, anybody. Understandable, would yeah. But Jim did a lot of that. He caused a lot of tensions with that. I would say, this song, Cried a Wild Heart, it was three records. So finally, Ron says, um, okay, I'm going to say we're going to cut the song. So Mark cuts it off. I want everybody to just put their instrument down and walk out of the room. I'm like, I, I, I can't do that. Why? Because I know what it's going to do to Jim. But maybe it'll help him. And I kind of went along with it. I did not like doing that at all. <laughs> I didn't think that was a good call because at a point you just say, but then Ron would say, but it's three records later. So certain things like that, I just wished, not wished. I think at the time it would have been a different way that for all of us, but Jim could have looked at it. And you know, you hire Jameson, you 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 write, we write, we write this song, search is over. And then, well, I want to sing it. I don't think that uh, let's run it past Ron, but you should tell Ron I could no, no, he yells at me because he says, Look, if you want to do this, and which I did produce records, you gotta fucking learn. No. So maybe there's some of that involved, you know. And then search is over the second verse. We would often as we write a song. So you want to get the cadence down and you just say, I'm going to, the second verse I go, I'm just, we would call it, I'm going to write a dummy verse, you know. Can we last forever? Will we fall apart? It's, at times, it's so confusing. These questions are the heart. Okay, we left town and Ron had the lyrics and they sang it with the dummy verse. Well, my phone rang. He gave me such a hassle with that thing. When it was number one, I called him every fucking week when we found out. That second verse really killed the fucking song, didn't it? That's how much I got driven nuts with it. So I don't know if I had this mixed blessing memo to see it all. 
And I never knew, well, maybe Jim's making a point, but then I would defer to the rep, to Ron. But then you get, well, you and Ron are closer. So you have fans, man. You got to just say, fuck. It's like walking a minefield. You're going to go, yeah. when I do this, it's going to be right, but that's going to blow up. And then, so then you just say to Ron, one day Ron said to me, let me tell you something. Yeah, I remember this. You pay me a awful lot of fucking money to be a buffer. <laughs> and I said to him, and you're worth every cent of it. So there's a lot of that that goes on. And I don't know, maybe bands don't talk about them enough. I can't speak for other bands, but we didn't. When we would try, it would be more resistance or on everybody's part. I'm not excluded. And um, I just thought that that whole thing could have, not should have, could have been avoided. All of it. All of it. I just think the whole thing, we should have left it alone after we got Jim and Jameson in the band and just continue on and if somebody i told jim one time if you don't want to do dates you and i can just write the fucking songs and we can go hire two other keyboard players and it won't matter and you won't you don't have to go on the road and that was offensive and i said but you just told me you don't want to be on the road so i try to come up with all these i would always go out of the guy i always go there and try to come up with some kind of like okay this would be healthy what you and i we could still write all these fucking songs because i love all that man no, I loved it. I don't have to be the guy either. That's a fucking bad trip. And I said to him, and we could still write, and then you don't have to come on the road. You just stay home and write or do whatever else you do. Are you trying to rip? No, you're irreplaceable. That's not, you know, it just gets to a point where I think that, I'm not going to even say it's the person, but there's obstacles that are not necessary that are placed there repeatedly. One or two you could deal with, but but in, but when it's repetition, you say, okay, now I'm, I know this. It's like I'm a fisherman, a fly fisherman. I know where the fish are, I know what they're biting on. When I can sense that coming, I'm like, no, 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 the hatch. That's the wrong bait, you know. So I kind of applied all that, and I just tried to be um, diplomatic, but. That only works to a point. As we're seeing around the world right now, I think you just have to be decisive and take your lumps and then tell your truth and tell the authentic truth without offending people and just be yourself and be comfortable being in your own skin. Because this business loves to yank us out of our skin, tug on our heart, tug on our soul, split our brains in half, just fuck with us and Take them, you know the business. It's everything they say about our team and business is true. The only difference between the music business and the movie business, the movie business deals in billions. We deal in millions. But they, it's just still the same game. So I think you just have to tell your own truth and try to live your own truth. It's hard. It's we all it's life. Yeah. Bands. Yeah. Fucking bands, man. What get the fuck over it? Just take a great. <laughs> No, I'm telling you, man, it's a fucking singer. Oh, bad, they're mad at me. Come on, man. Just have, like Steve Perry's a fucking great singer. Just won't do it anymore. I think people get scarred. They go, I don't want to deal with it. And you're like, but you're so fucking good. And then you go, yeah, bands can do that to a guy. They do do that. So I love them. And I still love them. I think it's the right combination. I heard Billy Joe, I like I'm a big Howard Stern fan because his interviews are so fucking good. They got really good. And I heard Billy Joe on his show the other day. He's talking about, you know, Stern said to him, You should do like a traveling Wilburys. And I'm a huge traveling Wilburys fan because you got Petty, you got Harrison. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. And Billy Joe said, Yeah, I, I I wanted to do that. He goes, I thought about me. And he goes, and maybe Paul McCartney. And he goes, and Ringo. And he goes, and then Jeff Beck, who is my ultimate fucking guitar hero, like everyone, including Clapton and Page, always been. And he goes, and then Jeff Beck died. So and I'm thinking, maybe Billy, Billy Gibbons, who I love, he's a fucking killer. And he goes, and maybe like a guy like John Mayer. I'm like, does anybody know how I can get a hold of Billy Joe? Because I'll go try. And then he'll say, this guy could actually play or something, you know, but I think like that. So I think I'm not alone. Because Billy had a killer band. You remember his band like in the 80s and 90s with Liberty DeVito? That was like the fucking history. And he just said they all got to be a nuisance and they thought they were. The, it, the same thing happened to him. And he's Billy Joel. So I said, call, call. And if I suck, just throw me out. 
And by the way, I, mean, I told you earlier, I'm a huge fan of John Mayer. He's really good. Yeah. He writes great songs. No, he does. He writes, his songs are great. He sings great. His lyrics are great. His fucking guitar playing, his acoustic guitar playing with all his tunings is killer. His lead guitar playing is great. His tones, he's, he's the whole thing. I said to him, no one says he doesn't, he hangs out like the comedians, which is kind of another thing to piss me off because I, I love the comedians. They're, they're, that's a hard, they're more tortured than we are. They don't get a laugh, they're done. The whole fucking day's going. They know, comedians and somebody said to me one time, John, I said, I got to get a hold of them. Yeah, it'll take a while. John doesn't have a lot of friends. And I said, I'll tell you why, because to whatever Jen that is, we're Jen and why, whatever these fucking tags yeah. are. I said that I mean, you're, he's the guy. What do you mean? I said he writes those songs, the lyrics, sings. I said, and the extra thing is, he gets all those hot chicks. So that's hard to, <laughs> to make friends with those other guys his age because they're probably going, "Who's he banging now?" Because he's John gets around, man. He's bad. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, he's really good. Watch him sometime. And he took Jerry Garth. Then he ends up in the dead. Yeah, that's fucking hard, man. Jerry was a fucking great guitar player. I was speaking just, of guitar plays, we're going to speak about you as well, because I've seen on social media that you, you're recording and you've got maybe four or five yeah, songs yeah. down. So so tell us about that. I What's happening? My own stuff. Well, I, I decided, and you know, okay, uh, I'm getting away from it. So there was a time when Epic wanted me to do this and the man was like really pissed off. You know, when you walk in the dressing room, it gets real quiet and you go, oh, these guys were talking about, you know. And I never did it because the guys in the band would get really mad. Like if I would go off and do Eddie's Money's record or I work with John Way or when I would do the hard stuff, the guys in the band get really mad at me. So the other day I said, I'm old. I don't know if I was scarred from it, but it did something to me. So I didn't really do much on my own. And then I started about maybe five years ago. I said, I'm going to do my own project. And I hooked up with this This guy. Was in, I'm not telling you, he was in Mayall's band. He did Mabel Staples record. This guy's badass. And all his guys, horn players. And I started doing stuff. And I called him about three or four months ago. I said, hey, dude, let's go on this thing. So today he just sent me a, one of the final tracks we cut here. Horns, strings, and all. And it's fucking great. So I thought, I'm doing my own project. I'm about five songs into it now. Which is a first. But I have to tell you, I'm... You know, when you say, why did you wait so long? I don't look at that. I waited because, and I don't really look at things this way. It's fucking really good, man. It's it's more me. It's my roots. Yeah, there's going to be some pop songs on it because I write them, but there's a couple old standards I cover, but I, I, I kicked them up to different notches. It's really cool. And then I got all these great players, man. They're all like brothers. You know, they play different. It's fucking great. I'm going to be really happy happy now but i'm going to be really happy when we get down to the guitar parts if i start practicing again <laughs> <laughs> i said to the guy i work with i said it's so fucking good i hope the guitar player is good enough to play it. <laughs> he goes you're so funny i said i don't know if it's funny but we'll find out but I, it'll be great i think it's more i like to be in the moment you know there's something about just you, you get one up there's something about when you're not aware that they have this record button pressed and you're playing and you play it back and you go if i fuck with that i'll ruin it that's more what i'm about like angus angus is like i played the fucking track once man solo and all that's it <laughs> isn't he and he's amazing man he's fucking amazing but i'm happy with it and i th i'm not an i don't have a deadline but i'd like to get out in the fall because i was telling my own manager i want to go and he says it's a really good idea so i want to play clubs how big? I don't know. 75. No, 75 seats. You got to pay 500. Whatever. I just want to go out and play the clubs because why? Because then I'm closer to the people at first. When you only may want you on packages and stuff, I said, I don't even want to think about that for now. I just want to take it a step at a time. So I look forward to going out and playing my own stuff for once with this great fucking band and having a great time. I look at it and I said, this is why Clapton probably had Steve Gadd in his band for like 40 years and Nathan Eason based and Andy Fairweather low and Chuck and he had uh, Billy Preston for a while. I mean, this, this is why you hang on to people for all those years because they make you a better player.
So that's how I'm looking at it. But yeah, I want to get it done. And I know I'm not in a hurry, but it moves along because the person I'm working with is just a fucking genius. And he's great at it. He moves it along. He's got great vibes and soul. And then I'm looking at maybe fall playing some dates. Wow. And you can't say fairer than that. Playing your own stuff out on the road, doing your own thing. It just you know where I want to do, do it at? I want to do it across the pond, your side of the pond. Because oh, I spent... Really? Well, in the 80s, we spent so much time there that there was a point I said, I'm going to buy a home in Germany. It's a beautiful country. It's mm. not Scotland's the fucking. <laughs> okay. If you want to fly fish, I mean, you know, Scotland's ridiculously beautiful and even Ireland. But I was going to look and buy a place in Germany because it's a different lifestyle. Yeah. I spent like a lot of Easter's there or, you know, holidays and it's kind of festive and the people are super cool. Yeah. I was starving. I went to this bar in Germany. I didn't even know the town, small town. I said, I'm hungry. Anywhere, anywhere I get something to eat, she said, I just made this beautiful some roast for my family. She gave me a plate of it. It was the best fucking roast I ever ate in my life. How much is it? No, it's on the house. It was, I've had great experiences there. So it's a little bit of a different cadence. I understand why people move over there. I do. And I also understand why the, 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 the English guys never leave. <laughs> you know, they live yeah. out in Sussex and Kensington. Mm -hmm. well, they just move up in places. But before that, they had apartments there. And they don't leave. It's a different thing. Like Mark Knopfler, he's one of my idols. He never leaves. I love, and it's, I was going to go work at the studio at one point. And the budget was kind of like, I didn't care until I realized I'd have to bring in 12 people and stuff. But, He's got that studio, British Grove. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's fucking great. He's great, by the way. He's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he could tell you about bands. We'll talk to him sometimes. He was in the <laughs> band. Talk to Sting, didn't they? Used to beat him up and stuff. You fucking Sting, you're famous. They like beat him up. And you ever read that book? Yeah. Well, I've spoke to Stuart Copeland. He's told me the stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he tells the truth, too, Stuart. Yeah. But it's hard. I just think that at the end of the day with music, if you're authentic and you do what you do best, um, it will resonate. If you try, it won't. Yeah, and that's absolutely. like the point. Absolutely. Well, Frankie, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you and hearing all your yeah. stories. It's uh, It's been wonderful. Oh, Thank I... you so much for your time. Oh, you're welcome, man. We get to see, once you, the guy that, here, I'm the quiet guy, see? <laughs> As I get going, phew, that's I'm off it. to the races, but I think, you know, people should know some of this stuff because they've only heard a story that's really not, it's fictional. And I think the unfictional version has the heart to it, the soul to it, the vibe to it, the people involved, amazing people involved in our, in my, and our careers. These are fucking great people. The producers, the A and R people, they're fucking great people. The assistant years, like one of them, the assistant engineers, excuse me, one of them went on to do Guns and Roses. And these are really good people. Our whole career. Yeah. Well, you have to you have to look at that and learn from it. Absolutely. Sure. And uh, we'll definitely have to get you back on in the fall as yeah. well when okay. the when the music drops. We'll we'll find out all about that yeah. as well. There, that that's worth it. Well, I hope you edit the shit out of this fucking thing and make it. <laughs> 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 it is what it is dude but i tell you this I, god is my witness man it is the gospel truth all that's of all it you can ask for it's all you can ask for well yeah. frankie enjoy the rest of your day i hope you have a lovely day and uh, thank you so we'll much for your time again i hope we'll talk again soon definitely definitely I take, take care, care. Of yourself, man. thanks now cheers hey, now. Hey, take care of your heart nobody else will <laughs>